the fields are ripe for the harvest. It is really a time to broaden the expanse of the influence of the church for a greater harvest. And how do we do that in our own context? And in our own ministry, as we first started in the 80s, as I said I worked with runaways and street kids and at-risk youth. And, but I found that many churches that tended to work better together were the ones that had a cause to, of compassion to reach out to the community in very real and tangible ways. People in prayer initiatives, compassion outreaches together. And I found it was important not to make compassion an event. Like, and that's not wrong to have prayer events and to have compassion outreaches and crusades and so on, but it should be a lifestyle. We should have a culture of prayer as the church, a, a culture of desire for the presence of God through worship. We should also have a culture of compassion that our hearts are broken with the things that breaks God's heart. And so what we began to do is identify the different ministries and churches in our own city and out of that relationship, it began to expand across the nation. And then our relationships in working in the fields in other countries, we began to see a connection happening there. And so when even natural disasters began to take place, people would actually kind of call us as a command center because there was relationship equity that was being built. That's a good word that I've, I've really felt that I've come to really appreciate because I had the president of one nation tell me, they said, you may be small on paper as an organization, but I've heard of all the relationship equity that you have. And because of that equity, you've helped to, to bring organizations together to help my nation. See, that's an important word. Our equity comes from first the Lord. And when we have favor with the Lord, He makes way for us with man. But as the church begins to work together, we have an exponential equity that is greater than individual, uh, individual influence. See, we can have positional influence, and that positional influence wanes once we no longer have that position. But if we have relational influence with God and with others, it out, far outlasts and outweighs the position that you might carry or the title you carry for now. I think it's important for us as the church to realize that, that as we expand the borders of our tent, it only comes out of that relationship equity. As I've said before, relationships define our destinies because the kingdom of God is built on relationship, first with God, then with one another. And the degree of influence that we have or leave to the next generation or have in our community is really determined on the level of those relationships with God and with other people. In Baltimore, for example, we have a chapter of our organization there, and there was a great need in one of the districts of Baltimore, and the police department was really struggling through high crime and, and, uh, and, and, and juvenile crime and other things that were going on there. So the churches began to come together, and some of the pastors came together, began to prayer walk, what I call on-site for insight. Sometimes it's better to get out of our prayer closet to go on-site to have a greater insight on how to really pray, not just with some sort of theory, but with really an experiential understanding of what's taking place around us. And soon they began to build friendships with the policemen there, and they began to write, do ride-alongs with them, and that's happening in various other cities as well. As a result of the, the church world being on-site for insight, beginning to get a heart and a strategy to reach the community, they began to work with business officials, they began to work with the police department, the mayor's office, the church is working together, and we began to see a transformation taking place in that community. As a result, it's opened the hearts of even the civil leaders, the civil government leaders, to the church's influence in that community. There's a respect now because they're not just declaring the gospel, they're being the gospel. I've heard it said, we've got to stop being the, being, doing church and start being the church. And that is so true, isn't it? I, I was thinking about John chapter 4 and verse 31 through 38. And uh, it really is about workers for the harvest. But when the, the disciples said to Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. And he said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And the disciples thought, well, has anybody brought him anything to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to complete his work. And then he goes on to say, Look up and see that the fields are ripe unto harvest. They're ready and white for the harvest. What is he saying? He said, Look, I have a satisfaction of fulfillment that only comes, not in the earthly food, but in fulfilling the will of the Father. See, we've been given this great responsibility a responsibility through compassion evangelism, through prayer initiatives, through outreaches to be the church, not just do church. And when we begin to do what God's called us to do and to fulfill this great commission that He's given to us, 
and it considered it an honor that we will begin to become satisfied in ways that earthly successes, earthly uh, uh, accolades, earthly food cannot do for us, only the place of doing the will of God. And then Jesus says, look up from where? Look up from your own two feet. Don't look at your own self-absorption, self-centeredness, selfishness. Look up from what you're thinking about and look up and see the fields are already white and ripe unto harvest. When we see the responsibility out there before us and we begin to realize that our food and satisfaction doesn't come in what we can get, get for ourselves, but in fulfilling the will of God, then we'll begin to take seriously the commission God has given us. The great missionary David Livingston used to say, why is it when an earthly king commissions us, we consider it an honor? But when the heavenly king commissions us, we call it a sacrifice. Oh, it's not a sacrifice to serve the Lord. It is an honor and a privilege to serve him and together be a tangible expression of Christ to so many multitudes that are looking for healing and hope and answers. We are the conduits of that answer through the Lord Jesus Christ.